Ayala learning Knichtas. Welcome to this series of videos in which we will explore the cultural contacts between early New England, Northern Africa and the Middle East. With these videos, we hope to give you some interesting examples of intercultural contact between the East, the West and the early Middle Ages. In our previous videos, we have seen that early medieval England was not unconnected to parts of Northern Africa and the Middle East. We've looked at trade, travelers, and literary imagination. In this fourth and last video of our series, we will take a look at intellectual exchange and provide you with some interesting examples of the import of knowledge into England from Northern Africa and the Middle East. We will start by looking at two leading figures, Theodore and Hadrian, who came to England and initiated what has been termed the Golden Age of Anglo-Saxon learning. Next, we will look at how old English medical writings show the influence of sources from Northern Africa and the Middle East. Lastly, we will look at Anglo-Saxon prognostics, texts that one could use to predict the future and which again show traces of the intellectual interaction between the East and the West. For our first example, we're going to go back to the late 7th century. The English had recently been converted to Christianity and they were in need of trained clerks and priests. The English chronicler Bede, in his ecclesiastical history of the English people, describes how the Pope in Rome decides to send two intellectual heavyweights to Britain to remedy this situation. The first of these was Theodore, who came from Tarsus, present-day Turkey and B describes him as a man well-trained in secular and divine literature, both Greek and Latin. Accompanying Theodore was a man named Hadrian, who likely came from Northern Africa, and B describes him as a man of African race and well-versed in the Holy Scriptures. Departing from Rome and arriving in Britain in the year 669, Theodore became Archbishop of Canterbury, and Hadrian became an abbot of a monastery in the same place. Together, they established an influential school, the Canterbury School of Theodore and Hadrian. They attracted many students, whom they taught many things, which Bede describes as some form of intellectual waterboarding in his ecclesiastical history of the English people. They attracted a crowd of students into whose minds they poured the streams of wholesome learning. They gave their hearers instructions not only in the books of Holy Scripture, but also in the art of meter, astronomy, and ecclesiastical computation. Never had there been such happy times as these since the English first came to Britain. The school of Theodore and Hadrian brought a great intellectual impulse to the Anglo-Saxons, and many of their students became great scholars and teachers themselves. As such, Theodore and Hadrian are often regarded as the starting point of what became known as the Golden Age of Anglo-Saxon learning, the 8th century, during which some of the most influential scholars were born in England. And they include the poet scholar Althelm, one of their students, the chronicler and scholar Bede, and the poet and scholar Alcuin. All of these Anglo-Saxon scholars wrote influential and learned works often in complex Latin. In fact, Theodore and Hadrian appear to have been particularly good at language training. And Bede mentions that some of their students knew Latin and Greek just as well as their native tongue. One trace of the language training of Theodore and Hadrian is a number of glossaries that can be ultimately traced back to their school. Perhaps the most famous one of these is the so-called Leiden Glossary which provides definitions of various difficult Latin words, either in Old English or in more simple Latin. And some of these definitions actually reference Theodore or Hadrian, like the following definition of the Latin word cineris from the Leiden Glossary. Cineris nablis ed est citaris longiores quam saltirium, nam saltirium triangulum fit, Theodorus Dixit, a type of harp, that is, kitaras, a Greek instrument, that are longer than a psaltery, because a psaltery is triangular, Theodore said. 
So there you have it. Along with meter, astronomy, ecclesiastical computers, and languages, Theodore also appears to have introduced his English students to Greek musical instruments. The school of Theodore and Hadrian must have been a multicultural and multilingual classroom, a place where various cultures and languages came together. Their teaching was influential, and we can certainly see elements of their multilingual scholarship throughout the early medieval English period. One particularly good example is this 10th century poem dedicated to one of their students, Oldhelm, which interestingly combines Old English half lines with half lines in Latin and some Greek-ish words. The poem is written from the perspective of one of the texts written by Oldhelm and goes as follows. Thus me zeta sanctus et justus, beon boca gleo, bonus auctor, eldelm athole sheop, etiam fuit, ipsilos on athole angle sexna, bishop on bretina, biblos each. Thus he composed me, holy and righteous, learned warrior of books, good author, old helm, noble poet. He was also exalted in the homeland of the Anglo-Saxons, a bishop in Britain, a book I... In this poem, we can clearly see a combination of languages, Old English, Latin, and Latinized Greek. This Multilingualism typified the learning introduced into Britain by two scholars from the Middle East and Northern Africa, Theodore and Hadrian. Moving on from the knowledge about holy texts and languages, we now turn to another important kind of scholarship in which we can clearly see some influence from Northern Africa and the Middle East, medicine. We have a fair number of medical texts written in Old English, and most of these are adaptations of Mediterranean sources, including works in Latin and Greek. As a result, many of these remedies in these Old English works mention spices, herbs, and even animals that were not native to England. Indeed, one specialist in Anglo-Saxon medicine has noted how Old English medical texts demonstrate that the surprising large selection of drugs and medical necessities from as far away as India Indonesia and China, as well as from Near East and African regions, was available in England. The Mediterranean origin of Old English medical writings, including this 11th century Old English herbarium, may explain one of these texts' curious characteristics. It is full of snakes! Just look at them crawling all over these pages! The Old English herbarium abounds in remedies against snake bites even though poisonous snakes are rather rare in early medieval England. Another manuscript of the same text demonstrates that we are indeed not dealing with adders native to England, but with more exotic species of snake. This particular snake with the horns and wattles, for instance, has been identified as the Saharan horned viper, a venomous snake native to the deserts of Northern Africa and parts of the Arabian Peninsula, and not early medieval England. This snake has been identified as a viperine water snake found in southwestern Europe and northern Africa, but not in England. These accurately drawn exotic snakes demonstrate that the English scribes may have been working with originals that ultimately derived from the Mediterranean areas. Another interesting example of the transference of medical knowledge from the Middle East to England comes from another Old English medical text, Bald's Leech Book. This compilation of remedies from the 10th century contains a small number of remedies that had been collected for the 9th century King Alfred the Great, who apparently was greatly troubled by a variety of stomach pains, constipations, and even diarrhea. Interestingly, it appears that these remedies had been sent to Alfred all the way from Jerusalem. We know this because the remedies are accompanied by the following text in the manuscript, which reads, this ale het thu sejan Alfred Kuninger, Domne Helias Patriarcha on Jerusalem. Thus, the Patriarch in Jerusalem commanded all this to be told to King Alfred. This Patriarch in Jerusalem is none other than Elias III, Patriarch of Jerusalem, who apparently took an interest in Alfred's ill health. 
Bald's leech book further records that Elias also sent to Alfred a very special white stone that could be used against all sorts of diseases, as well as provide protection from lightning and thunder. We'll probably never find out what kind of white stone it was, or whether it actually worked. Quick, take this! For magical white stones, it is perhaps a small step to our last example of intellectual import, a genre of texts that is known as prognostics, which are short texts that allow someone to make predictions about the future on the basis of dates, natural phenomena, and dreams. These texts make for pretty awesome reading, and we highly recommend you pick up a copy of these books, both called Anglo-Saxon prognostics. Like medical texts, Old English prognostic texts were heavily influenced by texts in Latin and Greek and show the influence of cultures in the Mediterranean and Northern Africa and the Middle East. Among the most common Anglo-Saxon prognostic texts are lists of so-called Egyptian days, unlucky days during which all sorts of disasters might take place. In particular, the medical act of bloodletting could go horribly wrong when done on one of these unlucky days. Here you can see one example of a text mentioning these Egyptian days in one Old English text. It reads, Through dagas sundon on yere theoe egyptiaki hata, that is on ure ye theode plichliche dagas. There are three days in a year that we call Egyptian, that is in our language dangerous days. It is unclear why these unlucky days are called Egyptian days. But it is possible that it was assumed that Egyptian astronomers were the first to identify these, or there is a reference to the biblical plagues of Egypt. The text goes on to say that the dangerous days are the first Mondays of the month of May, August, and January. I guess even the Anglo-Saxon did not like Mondays. One of the earliest mentions of an unlucky day for bloodletting is linked to Theodore of Tarsus, we mentioned at the start of this video. In his ecclesiastical history, Bede relates how Bishop John of Beverly chastised the doctor who foolishly endangered a girl by letting her blood on an unlucky day. Then he, Bishop John, asked when the girl had been bled, and on hearing that it was the fourth day of the moon, he exclaimed, You have acted foolishly and ignorant to bleed her on the fourth day of the moon. I remember that Archbishop Theodore of blessed memory used to say that it was very dangerous to bleed a patient when the moon is waxing and the ocean tide flowing. Another kind of prognostic text that shows the clear influence of the Mediterranean and Near Eastern cultures are dream books. These are texts that outline how various dreams ought to be interpreted. According to one such Anglo-Saxon dream book, dreaming of cheese would imply wealth. Old shoes predict deception. Dream of pigs is a warning for illness. Frogs indicate anxiety. And dreaming of many goats is a sign of vanity. Intriguingly, these dream books also include references to animals that an Anglo-Saxon was unlikely to encounter in real life, including camels and elephants. Of course, dreaming about these animals also held meaning. Camels predict harm. An elephant stood for an accusation. Dreaming about a running lion was a sign of success, but dreaming about a sleeping lion implied bad business, while being attacked by a lion meant impending discord. While it's entirely possible that many Anglo-Saxon monks had vivid dreams about elephants, camels, and lions, the presence of these animals in the Old English dream books probably has more to do with the fact that these texts ultimately have their origins in places where these animals were a more common occurrence. Indeed, prognostics expert Sondor Chardonnens has noted how many of the animals that are mentioned in these dream books and other prognostic texts can be explained by the fact that prognostications hail from Mesopotamia, Syria, Egypt, Greece, and the Mediterranean. And the animals mentioned in these prognostic texts tend to represent species indigenous to these areas. With that, we come to the end of this video. We hope that we've given you an idea of how Anglo-Saxon learning was enriched 
by the intellectual imports of scholars and texts from Northern Africa and the Middle East, ranging from Theodore and Hadrian to remedies for snakes and dream explanations. This was the last video in our series on cultural contact between early medieval England, the Middle East and Northern Africa. We hope you have enjoyed our video series and that we have, in some way, followed Theodore and Hadrian's example and poured into your mind some streams of wholesome learning. This video was made possible by Leiden University's Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Fund.